I would like to now invite uh, Lieutenant um, General Jonathan Riley from it says here, British Army, from the United States Army, the speaker said. So I won't actually... There we go. Well, generals, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for doing me the honor of uh, asking me to be here today. Uh, I've been, during my nearly 40 years of active military service, predominantly a field commander. And I'm therefore coming at the subject with uh, that baggage. Uh, I've been called many things in my life, but uh, never a lawyer. So uh, uh, it's the field command on which I'm, I'm concentrating. But, but, I saw what happened in the Balkans when commanders like Ratko Mladic uh, deliberately ignored uh, or forgot their responsibilities under the law of armed conflict. Uh, and in more recent years, I've been very much concerned with targeting and decision-making at a senior level in the Balkans, uh, in Sierra Leone, in West Africa, in Iraq, uh, and in Afghanistan. Please let me also make it clear to you that I'm coming at this from, uh, the, co uh, from the point of view of an operational or theatre-level commander, uh, having had there all the advantages of staff to help me and time. Uh, commanders at the tactical level carry the same responsibilities that I did under international law, and their task can arguably be more difficult in dynamic and high-tempo combat, and allowances have to be made for that. Uh, I'd also be um, begin by telling you that command is like sovereignty. It can't be compromised or shared. Parts of it can be delegated, but ultimately it's the senior commander of an operation that the buck stops. He is responsible for the operation, he holds control of all the resources, and he is accountable for the consequences of his orders. If you try to separate responsibility from resource control and from accountability, you will get into trouble. That said, the first duty of a field commander is, of course, to carry out his mission using all such ways as a, and means as are appropriate, available, and legal. Those three qualifications apply not just to the most senior commander, but also to his subordinates. And therefore, it's any senior commander's duty to see that his subordinates understand that their actions are bounded by the law. And that applies whether a conflict is state on state or internal or irregular. First premise is that because much of the commander's ability to determine what is or is not appropriate and legal will depend on his intelligence. And intelligence is all, is all about the understanding of the environment and the enemy so as to be able to take action at whatever the appropriate level in a timely and effective manner. No objective uh, should ever, uh, ideally, be identified, tracked or struck on the basis of single source intelligence. To do that risks either being the victim of the opponent's de uh, deception operations or hitting the wrong target or causing unacceptable levels of collateral damage. Now, a target may be initially identified by a single intelligence source, maybe a human source, but layered intelligence must subsequently be developed on any target for reasons I'll make clear later on. Absolute certainty uh, in this business is seldom, if ever, achievable for a commander. In conventional warfare, questing for certainty is, uh, we were always told, regarded uh, as bad practice because it reduced tempo, and tempo is the rate or rhythm of activity relative to the enemy. But in irregular warfare, given the legal and media factors in play, and especially those concerned with the avoidance of civilian casualties, a higher degree of assurance in target identification has to be sought. Even allowing for the huge advances in, target, in, in our ability to see the battlefield and to track targets, the urban built environment offers exceptional camouflage, both physical and human, which insurgents and terrorists will seek to exploit. So it's frequently, therefore, in my experience, uh, a com uh, the fact that a commander will choose not to strike a target if the identification is uncertain or if the risk of civilian casualties can't be assessed. And he'd be right in that judgment, because if there's a chance that the planned action may lead to a breach of the law of armed conflict, the commander is obliged to take positive action to stop that happening. This uh, particular process 
uh, will be informed by prior planning and preparation, especially the business of forming a proportionality assessment, which was referred to earlier. And that begins with the identification of a target. And I hope that I don't have to go into the definition of what a target is here. Now, it's done by military intelligence staffs who prioritise targets by selecting those of, that are high value. Uh, and a high value target is something, is, a, is one that the loss of which would significantly damage the enemy's capability to achieve his intentions. And the high value uh, target list is used by the operations staff to nominate high payoff targets. And the difference between the two is that high payoff uh, targets are those the destruction or neutralization of which are deemed critical to our success. And they get listed in an order of priority. The value of a target is a key planning factor uh, thereafter, because without being sure of a target's value, a commander can't make the judgment about what can or cannot be justified in attacking it. Now, from my experience, I can say that there is a good deal of science that can be applied to selecting and then ranking targets. They include things like operational analysis, air and satellite photographs, real-time visual or infrared imagery from air platforms, observation from the ground, electronic in intercept, and humans. And all of those have to be fused by an intelligent staff. And they use all available methods in parallel rather than independently. And using them, the commander has to achieve positive identification. That is, a reasonable certainty or whether, of whether or not the object that he wants to attack is a combatant uh, or a valid military object and how important it is. So when uh, a person or an object has been identified as a target and it's considered of high, as, as high value and it can be struck, but an attack would risk civilian casualties, then a proportionality test must be developed. In order to determine when expected civilian casualties will be excessive in relation to the military advantage gained if an attack is made. Now, at that point... Uh, the commander will probably call together his targeting group, which may go under various titles. And here's me with mine in Basra. Uh, it's usually the commander, senior staff officers responsible for, uh, for intel and ops, senior special forces officers, commanders of subordinate formations likely to be involved, legal and media or STRATCOM's advisors, and the commanders of any offensive support troops. The commander and that targeting group must know their duties and responsibilities relating to the protection of civilians contained in the law of armed conflict. The key principles that will then guide the formation of a propor proportionality assessment by this targeting group are that only military objectives must be attacked and that such attacks must be discriminate, humane, distinct, proportionate and necessary. And I'm sure you've all heard those terms, but let me just briefly explain how those are applied. Military necessity authorises the use of force required to accomplish those actions that have a legitimate military rationale. Now, that's a necessary precondition, and it's a minimum criteria. We don't attack a target just because it's military in nature. There has to be a military advantage. And we don't use any more force than is necessary to achieve the desired effect. And if there's a choice between targets that will realise a similar military advantage... Um, but one would risk more uh, 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 damage to civilians than another one. The one that offers the least is usually attacked. Humanity forbids us to inflict suffering, injury or destruction which is not actually necessary for the accomplishment of, of a legitimate military purpose. And once a military purpose has been achieved, the further infliction of damage is not necessary. In terms of distinction... Uh, we direct an attack or offensive action against only military objectives and we take all fe feasible precautions in the choice and the methods of attack with a view to avoiding or at least minimising incidental loss of civilian life or indeed injury to civilians and damage to civilian objects. So a targeting group will have to decide whether to use a precision strike from a laser-guided uh, missile or bomb, uh, an area weapon such as artillery uh, or a ground force to attack a target. Now, this applies even when, in counterinsurgent warfare, civilians may be engaged in criminal activity. Criminals are still civilians, and they may only be attacked if they're demonstrably engaged in military actions. Uh, indiscriminate attacks, of course, are those that strike military objectives and civilians uh, without distinction, and they're prohibited. And a disproportionate attack would also be considered, considered indiscriminate. 
Uh, and last of all, proportion in terms of proportionality, uh, a disproportionate attack would, uh, would cause incidental loss of civilian life uh, or injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects or any of those that would be excessive in relation to the military advantage that we anticipate. Uh, from a, the point of view of an operational commander, I would say that military advantage refers to the advantage from the attack considered as a whole and not from isolated or particular parts of it. Now, judgments on numbers are very difficult in these situations. Uh, but the deaths of a small number of civilians might well be accepted by a commander ordering a strike on a seriously high-value target, such as a senior leader in a counterinsurgency campaign or a valuable intelligence source working for the other side. Numbers and proportionality must be judged, therefore, in relation to the harm being caused or likely to be caused by not attacking the target as well. And in that context, for example, insurgents, bandits or terrorists who are directing attacks on civilians, even if it's only a single person, remain a valid target because of the harm being caused and the deliberate flouting of international law. The um, next thing that I'd like to mention is positive identification. Uh, and that's a slide from an operation uh, in Iraq during my time in command in Basra. But positive identification in the fluid circumstances of counterinsurgency, especially in urban or close terrain, does not mean a 100% mathematical certainty. Even so, commanders should do everything feasible within their resources to verify that their target is a military objective. And if positive ID is lost, it must be re-established before a target's engaged. Positive ID uh, must be uh, complemented by the final factor, which is that of establishing pattern of life around the target areas. Uh, it was something we learned in Northern Ireland and carried with us thereafter. And what pattern of life does is it supports or challenges the expectations of collateral damages and thus informs a commander's judgment. It has to be gathered using every available intelligence in source and indeed open sources over the longest period that we can manage and it must include the anticipated times of normal civilian activity. Now, when all's been said and done, on the science of decision-making by commanders, please understand that the human factor remains. Target identification, ranking, decisions to strike are all underpinned by as much art as science. They are highly dependent on the intuition, that is, the experience and the intelligence of the commander and the advice of the staff. And because of that, the decision to strike most targets remains at a very senior rank, whatever the level to which the authority to strike has been delegated, usually the commander, deputy commander, or chief of ops only. So in ISAF, for example, I was one of any three people authorised to make decisions on the striking of high-value targets. Having considered all these issues, a targeting group uh, should be able to come to a view on whether or not a strike can be justified as against the risks of collateral damage and make recommendations to the commander. It's then the commander or his authorised deputy who says yes or no. And I do recall one decision that was raised at the level of the commander of US CENTCOM. Looking at UAV footage, it was clear that there were a number of extremely high value individuals who could be killed by a strike. But there were also a significant number of tribal elders and others who would be killed or injured. The commander therefore declined permission to launch a strike. That decision may have cost NATO soldiers' lives in the months that followed, and he did not take it lightly. I think it's what Stan McChrystal later called courageous restraint. <laughs> Briefly, uh, let me uh, touch on the business of advance warnings. Uh, in conventional warfare, of course, a force commander must uh, consider giving effective advance warning to non-combatant non combatants. Uh, and the law of armed conflict anyway prohibits attack by lethal means on undefended towns, villages, buildings or dwellings. But in irregular warfare, it's much more difficult because of the fluid nature of fighting, the fleeting nature of targets and the modus operandi of the enemy, who will use the civilian population and the built environment as cover, either by coercion or bribery or by exploiting sympathies. Now, advance warnings can be made by various means, the media, personal contacts, uh, leaflets, depending on uh, the situation and the time available. They may, of course, at times be unfeasible or they might compromise the security and the lives of the soldiers. And it's therefore the commander's call uh, at what point or whether or and how or not they're given. Another difficult decision. 
I spoke about uh, collateral damage. Um, the analysis of the expectation of this is, again, an exercise in military judgment by a targeting group, and it uses its collective experience and training. But it needs the support of scientific measurement and the understanding of weapons effects to do this right. And usually, there are two factors uh, that are considered uh, around about a target, and they're those. And using those, collateral damage predictions have to be made for any target that's given to a commander for his decision, uh, like that one to John Abazaid, along with the proportionality assessment. And it's particularly important in war among the people. I'd add that a force commander, his staff and subordinates, will seek to avoid any civilian casualties, but that's an ideal. And the nature of terrain, weather, human geography, the limitations on the avail availability of ISTAR and strike assets, the fleeting nature of targets, all combine to make this sometimes unachievable. And we may, therefore, uh, cause civilian casualties unwittingly. But there will also be occasions when a commander will order a strike in the knowledge that civilian casualties must occur. In the final analysis, uh, that decision must always be judged against the military advantage being gained, and there is no science to that. But part of the proportionality test is to, assure, is to ensure that an assessment has been made on the likely impact on the civilian population and to ensure that an attack is not indiscriminate. It will be also the commander's decision uh, on the weapon to be used in achieving a desired effect. Does he want to kill a single person or hit a large concentration of hostile troops or insurgents? Is it to destroy armoured vehicles or hit buildings like aircraft hangars or munitions depots or fuel dumps? Is it to hit bunkers or fortified positions? Each one of those requires a different mix of munitions, fuses, delivery means, and a decision on whether a smart munition or an iron bomb or an artillery shell will do the job, or whether it's one for troops on the ground. And along with that, and in parallel, the nature of the target will be reviewed. Is it static or moving? Is it protected? Will it fight or fire back? Is it fleeting or opportunity? And the target's value will never be very far from that judgment. The level of collateral damage risk uh, is usually laid down in a targeting directive, and that has to be uh, addressed. And it's usually classified as high, medium, or low, uh, and it can be uh, derived from weapons effects, or it can be uh, derived uh, using um, measurements of the cover from buildings and the nature that they are available uh, using those sorts of measurements. And it's those uh, processes that identify the various alternatives open to, open to a commander when prosecuting an attack, and which me measures and mitigates the possibility of collateral damage. And the rules of engagement are a key measure in informing this choice of alternatives. In broad terms, I think the more densely populated the area, the more discriminate the weapons used are likely to be. The more likely they are to be smart munitions, the more likely that the decision to strike will be held by a commander at a high level, and the more likely it is that the target will be watched and designated. My last point is perhaps a little oblique. General Julian Thompson, who commanded a brigade in the Falklands War, used to talk to the British Staff College. And when he did so, he said that in order to fulfil his role, in essence, a commander had to be able to do three things. Uh, they were those, uh, to find out what was going on, um, both friendly forces and enemy, flanks, rear, and so on. Uh, to talk to his subordinates and his superiors, to know his superior's intention and pass on his to his subordinates. Uh, and to communicate with the staff so that they could solve problems uh, and impose uh, control measures. Now, I think in the circumstances of uh, the modern world and modern war, a fourth essential function uh, must be added to those. A commander must be able to explain, to explain to his own people, to the enemy and to the uncommitted what he has done, what were the results and why it was necessary. Partly, this is to ensure that the other side does not own the narrative, given the immediacy and omnipresence of the world's media, and that the media is not wrong-footed by misinformation uh, or hoodwinked by disinformation, in particular by spurious uh, reports of civilian casualties. However, it's also to underline that matter of accountability, uh, which cannot be separated from responsibility and control of resources, as I said at the beginning. 
if a commander can't explain that his actions were appropriate, necessary, proportionate, discriminate, discriminate and legal, then I'm sorry, he's fighting the wrong war. <laughs>